Uh, I have next to me Josh Bailey. Um, he plays around with Tesla coils for fun, which is awesome, I think. Um, so we are going to see a lot of uh, lightning indoor, a lot safer than outdoors. So you choose wisely. So we should have video, we should have audio, and we are all good to go. So give, uh, give a, a very warm welcome to Josh Bailey. Ah, thank you. It's very good to be here. Um, although I'm off to a strong start, I haven't even started talking and we already had an emergency. So I guess that's a good. Okay, so um, my name is Josh Bailey. Sorry, I'll come down a bit. Um, I'm a software engineer for Google based in New Zealand. It's a very small office. Uh, my cat also helps. Um, and for some hobbies, um, I play around with uh, Tesla coils. Um, and what I want to try and show you this evening is a bit of demonstration and discussion about trying to make coils um, perhaps a bit more musical. Um, this is kind of based around, I think a lot of people have been uh, playing music on coils for a while. Um, and uh, I think the level of technology has been, it's amazing that it works at all. Um, so uh, I made some friends with some musicians and we tried to uh, push the, the state of the art a bit. So uh, I'm not sure if it's a good musical direction, but we'll see what you think. So uh, this system is so complex, I can't even begin to explain it, um, as signified by this diagram. Uh, what I'll describe is a system where we have a musician, um, a, a keyboard controller, uh, something called Chime Red, which is the synthesizer module, and then a, a Tesla coil. Um, and as you can see, the, the musician is physically and, and logically isolated uh, from the coil, because we don't want to, to kill the musician, that's bad form. And I'll just give a uh, very brief uh, demonstration of a couple of clips so you can see um, how it sounds. So I'm not sure how it's gonna sound on these speakers, but I guess let's try. I guess that worked. Uh, there's another uh, mode which is also useful for protecting your car. Okay, you kind of get the idea. <laughs> Thank you, so I'll try and um, explain um, a little bit further. So uh, I'm a, a software engineer, I'm not a musician, um, and uh, um, what I've tried to do is um, go talk to some musicians and have them explain to me in small words that I can understand uh, what things that they need, what abstractions they need uh, from the control system to, to make it sound interesting uh, and to actually use the coil uh, as a synthesizer. And uh, the first feature actually, just to call out here, um, what I'm doing is, um, uh, if you don't remember anything else about the presentation, the synth module is very, very carefully and precisely controlling uh, the amount of power going into the coil from moment to moment. Um, this is really, really, really important. Um, put too much power or get it wrong by a millionth of a second and there's running and screaming. Um, hopefully some from the audience or the, uh, the musician, um, and uh, not enough, um, and you don't get these interesting audio effects. So I'll explain a bit more in detail what those are. Okay, um, in this next uh, little clip, what we did is um, uh, try something a little bit different. When one coil is not enough and two is too low, uh, you need three coils at the same time. 
um, and why not add a, a robot drummer and a robot bass player? Um, so in this uh, performance, um, we tried to get all these robot instruments to, to play together. Uh, we had some, uh, some problems. Uh, the, the drummer did catch on fire. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, uh, we just noticed this during a, um, uh, a practice session. The uh, coils um, jammed the, uh, the robot's uh, controller, so it, uh, it jammed hard on and the actuator caught on fire. Um, that was a bit sad, um, but the uh, robot bass player uh, survived kind of okay. So this actually, this is a composition by a friend of mine called um, uh, Jason Long in New Zealand, uh, and the bass player was, was built by uh, uh, my friends James uh, McVeigh and Jim Murphy. So I'll just play you a little uh, snippet so you can kind of see them, them all working together. And if we have time at the end, uh, I'd be happy to play the, uh, the whole clip. Okay, what you're looking at first, just before I start, is the, the robot bass player. Um, so it has uh, four strings there. Um, you can see an actuator there that rotates the, the picks, and there are fingers um, that travel along the, the slides there so it can, it can play. I've got to say, while I'm proud of the coils, um, I'm really envious of the, uh, uh, the robot bass player. It does tend to, to try and wander around the room as it plays. It's quite uh, vigorous. Okay, um, a brief foray into uh, Tesla coil theory. Um, so just a summary of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so what do I mean by music? So first thing is, um, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, I'm not a musician, so um, I don't actually know what I mean by music. Uh, I'm just trying to, to make some interesting noises, um, so I hope they're in, enjoyable to you. Um, some more demonstration videos of some individual effects, so you can hear exactly what's happening. Um, just a very brief discussion of um, how uh, coils actually make uh, these various sounds, um, and some interesting things that we observed uh, having the system interact with uh, its environment, put it that way. Um, what the uh, musician is able to do um, via the, the MIDI protocol, which is a standard protocol for controlling musical instruments, and some uh, future developments, uh, including a uh, prototype vocoder. So um, I'm not ready to show you that uh, yet, but we have been able to, to make the coils speak, um, which is um, extremely disturbing uh, to be around. <laughs> Okay, and uh, yeah, so just to highlight, I'm, I consider myself an instrument um, maker, and um, I'm very keen to hear from musicians or other instrument makers or you know, anybody on, on suggestions or things that uh, could be made better. Okay, because um, <laughs> I'm a software engineer, uh, I get into a little bit of hardware, and uh, here's the first problem that confronted me in this project. Uh, this is my idea of a user interface. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's, uh, this is the, the gate controller that goes very near the, uh, the coil itself. Um, as you can see, it's um, extremely complex. You have um, one switch for arming and safe. Uh, there's a, a light to tell you if it's armed, and there's another light to tell you if the coil is firing. Uh, but probably if you're uh, close enough to see that light come on, um, then you'll probably see some other lights uh, before you go away. Um, now, can you see here, there's a, a fiber optic cable um, here, and this is obviously very um, important to keep the, um, the coil electrically isolated from uh, musicians or anything around. Uh, most musicians have to deal with ground loops at some point in their lives. Here we don't really want to include a, a high voltage loop um, as well. <laughs> and yeah, just to really show you, um, I'm not a hardware expert. <laughs> Uh, so this is a, uh, or was, a homemade um, gate driver for a coil. Um, and this did actually work for, for several seconds. Um, <laughs> there, is a, uh, there was a, a chip there um, that kind of went away into a different universe. Um, didn't come back. I actually kind of impressed that it's just gone. Like, um, it, it left some of the legs behind. 
So yeah, um, I have no business going near any of this, but um, that doesn't stop me. Um, and here's an, actually another, I have to acknowledge a very good friend of mine, Patrick Hurd. So Patrick and I built a, a very large coil uh, called Perimeter, um, which is 20 kilowatts. Um, so I have uh, three phase power coming to my house, which is very convenient. Um, and uh, Patrick and I decided to make a coil uh, to use that. And uh, it runs a bit hot, so he water cooled it. Um, and if you're interested, uh, there's a, um, uh, an article on Hackaday, which um, is quite interesting read by itself. Um, there's some uh, advanced technology there. As you can see, there's like a kind of a plastic water reservoir there. Uh, some fans we ripped off a, um, uh, uh, a large uh, computer cooler. Uh, seems to work pretty well, um, though I don't really like to go anywhere near it when it runs. Okay, the uh, sound um, itself. So what you're looking at here, this is a still of um, uh, one of the coils playing in, in uh, the videos I'll show you a bit later. So this is a, a very hot um, arc. The arc has actually stopped, but it's actually set a lot of um, uh, component gases and things in the air on fire. Um, and uh, it's made quite an interesting visual effect, which was something that we were going for. Um, now, of course, this is something we don't want to happen too often. Um, that means that we're switching a lot of power um, in there. Um, that's pretty stressful on uh, the components in the coil. So this is actually one of the key design um, elements in the system. Um, coils of this design handle uh, peak currents of many thousands of amps. Um, so it's, it's important to have a way to keep that down. Um, and the coil makes its noise uh, by um, explosively heating the, the air. So very, very rapidly heating the air um, as the arc passes through it. And we're controlling uh, the sound or controlling the notes that it plays uh, by just choosing exactly when and for how long and over what period of time to add uh, power to the arc. Um, and there's also uh, some non, many non-linear things um, as well. The, the arc will move around as the, the air heats, um, as things um, come into contact with the arc. Uh, and we had also explored um, making a machine for the coil to, to play with a bit um, to change the, uh, the sound of the arc. So we haven't got too many results on that yet, but that's a topic of active research. Uh, so again, I know I keep saying I'm not a uh, hardware engineer, so here's my, one of my typical circuit diagrams, um, how a, a coil works. Um, I'm sorry, the person is not to scale. Um, so this one is actually of uh, a perimeter. In um, Tesla coil terms, it's called a uh, offline Tesla coil. Um, there's a big uh, IGBT uh, there, a big, essentially a big transistor, which controls the power. Um, this was quite interesting because it's about as large as a brick. Uh, can handle a peak current of 10,000 amps, which we do actually use, um, and requires that I have a, uh, an export license. Um, so that's stuck to my refrigerator, which says that I promise not to make uh, WMDs or anything else uh, without the prior permission of Mitsubishi. As long as Mitsubishi gets a cut, I guess it's okay. Um, so uh, the, the key thing to look at here, um, right in the center is the, the transistor which controls the power and there's a, a box down there, gate driver. And this is where most of the, the magic is, is deciding exactly when to turn that, that transistor on and off. Um, and in this case, it's going on and off uh, maybe a few th thousand times a second for maybe 25 to 35 microseconds at a time. So not very long at all. Oh, and uh, I'm feeding it with a, um, in our case, a 20 kilowatt, 1,000 volt power supply. So yeah, just kind of in summary, um, uh, to produce the sound, we need to control the power. Um, we choose exactly when um, and for how long to turn the power on. Um, and uh, the thing that makes it actually interesting is um, you have to be very careful when you're combining multiple notes, multiple waveforms. Um, you can have a, a chord of death, you know, just by having the musician hammer, hammer down all the keys, you could blow the system up. So um, the synth module has been specifically designed so that that will not happen. Um, and that uh, the, the sound is consistent as possible um, while also using the, most amount of, the least amount of power and uh, um, being as, as gentle on the components as possible. So I did, in a very early prototype with this, uh, connect a uh, guitar to it. Um, I kind of bypassed a lot of these things. I thought, okay, this is gonna be great. Uh, I'll, I'll just do a quick test. So I'll play Owner of a Lonely Heart on there because I'm old and from the 80s, so that's fine. 
Um, but I'll, I'll play a couple of bars and then I'll, then I'll video it. And uh, I played a couple of bars and bang, uh, the coil blew up. Uh, the power supply kind of left its case and went all across the room. And uh, I was, there was uh, lots of gnashing of teeth and I couldn't even look at it for six months. So that was a very good learning experience. Okay, um, so this leads uh, to uh, the system called Chime Red, which is the synthesizer module that um, enables all these audio effects. So I'll, I'll show you some demonstrations on um, uh, some of the effects it enables. Oh yeah, um, so why uh, have this magic box at all? So um, uh, from the musician's point of view, they don't want to know about high voltages or coils or duty cycles or any of that stuff. Um, they just want to be able to, uh, to have a, a great time and uh, turn some knobs. Um, so, you know, that sounds like fun. So how do we do that? Um, and also, actually, by the way, uh, I tend to use uh, Ableton, which I, I understand is actually written in um, Berlin, which is kind of cool. So I apologize if somebody uh, is um, in the audience from uh, Ableton. So I had a kind of negative experience. Um, occasionally, we'd have some compatibility problems, and uh, I'd be pretty certain that Ableton uh, was the cause. So I would log a, a bug with Ableton, and they'll say, oh, you know, what kind of synthesizer are you using? And I'm like, oh, it's a, it's a coil. And they're like, did you try rebooting it? So I'm like, okay, I'll reboot the coil, and uh, it still does the same thing. <laughs> okay, so just a brief summary on uh, uh, something called MIDI. MIDI is a, um, a very simple serial cable style protocol. It's traditionally how it's done uh, for... Um, uh, connecting uh, things like keyboards and synthesizers uh, together. Um, so it's just a way that we can uh, provide some isolation between what the musician uh, is directly controlling, what they're touching, and what's happening at the high voltage end. So it's, uh, it's very, very simple. Um, it's basically, a, it runs at about 33K, uh, um, and you send bytes to say, start playing a note, stop playing a note, uh, do something to a note, like change its pitch, or change uh, some function inside the synthesizer itself. And uh, traditionally, it's over a, um, a little five pin uh, DIN uh, cable. It can run over USB and other things, though. So the main point of this is that um, you can actually use any MIDI capable system, any keyboard uh, with this, and it should work just fine. All right, so to be musically interesting, um, my musician friends uh, told me that um, they need some things. So the first thing is they need uh, to be able to play many notes at once. And uh, if you look at a lot of the coil controllers that you can buy now, uh, they uh, often have like maybe one note, or sometimes they uh, can play two notes, so you can have both the notes. It's pretty advanced. Um, but um, you know, people really need some more than, uh, much more than that. Uh, the next thing is uh, they say they need is uh, controlling, um, if you like, to speak very loosely, the volume of each note, uh, or very precisely uh, the volume of the note as it's playing. Um, so that's very, very important, rather than just playing at a fixed volume, which is what a lot of controllers do. Uh, being able to change the pitch in various ways as it changes, um, including uh, if you're a musician, um, be able to uh, map a low frequency oscillator um, of different waveforms to, to it. Maybe we will see some filters. Um, and also being able to combine different kinds of waveforms uh, together to give a more complex sound. So one of the videos that I first showed you right at the beginning, um, where we had a relatively small coil, but it was producing quite a, a, a rich kind of bass note, um, that's what we were doing, is combining uh, the output of several oscillators together. So I'll, I'll show you uh, how those work. Okay, yeah, and as you summarize the... Um, uh, common limitations are seen in, in other controllers is you know, no dynamics, maybe, and maybe only one or two notes um, at once, and just one uh, note, uh, sorry, one oscillator per note, so quite just a simple tone. So we want to do better than that. Um, started in about 2012, um, we had a, a prototype called Pipe Organ um, that could do four notes at once. Uh, we started with no dynamics, but then we added some. Um, and last year we got to, to Chime Red um, after learning a lot and, and blowing up some silicon along the way. So, yeah, it's not very beautiful. This is the original uh, uh, pipe organ prototype, um, which now uh, sits on my desk to stop papers blowing away in the wind. 
um, but certainly learned a lot uh, from it. And actually what's inside there is, is basically just an Arduino. Uh, Chime Red, the new system, is an Arduino Due. Um, this is just a regular uh, Uno in there. Okay, so now um, what I'm going to show you, uh, this system can do uh, 16 notes at once. Um, you can assign multiple oscillators um, per note and you can tune them. Um, there's an FM uh, synthesis mode, uh, which is kind of exciting if you like <coughs> some of these complex sounds that FM synthesis can give you. Um, there are three LFOs with um, some features which I'll, I'll demonstrate for you. Uh, and uh, you get very fine control of um, uh, the dynamics. Um, so you can control the volume uh, over time in different ways. So what does all this mean? Okay. So I'm just going to play you a video of starting off with one oscillator per note, and then I'm going to add uh, more oscillators, and then I'm going to move them around relative to the, the fundamental note. And so you'll hear the sound uh, change. You have to admit that results in um, uh, many hours uh, with a, a drum machine and, and like a sit station downstairs in my house just making noises like that, trying to learn what to do with it. Okay, so um, another example here. Um, in this case, I'm uh, using a configurable low frequency oscillator um, to, to change the sound of uh, those notes again. Um, so what I'm doing is uh, adding the oscillator, um, changing its speed and its depth, I mean, as we're changing its uh, waveform. So you hear it go from, uh, from sine to triangle and also uh, sawtooth. And it's kind of important because um, this allows you to simulate uh, some drum uh, sounds. So I have another video, if we get time to at the end, where she shows the coil functioning as a, as a drum machine. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't uh, sure how that sound, but you probably hear there's kind of like a scratchy, raspy uh, sawtooth sound uh, towards the end, which is kind of fun to play with. Um, it also sounds um, uh, quite a lot uh, more interesting live. This is more, high, uh, more harmonics. Okay. Um, oh, um, so another feature is um, having very high resolution uh, pitch bends. Um, so this is actually how my friend uh, Jim did the, the car alarm simulation. Um, he just went in with Ableton um, using the Ableton draw tool and uh, just picked the notes that he wanted and then just very carefully kind of hand sculpted all the, uh, the waveforms so they would sound um, the way that he wanted. Um, I thought that was uh, pretty nerdy and pretty cool. Um, <laughs> um, but it's actually quite a nice um, learning experience for me is how uh, electronic musicians want to, to work with the instrument. Like they really want to get in and have this very precise uh, control. So what does the hardware look like? Um, so this uh, uh, is the, the front panel here. Um, the system has evolved a bit more from that prototype that you first saw. Um, so uh, you have a nice uh, key switch to, um, uh, to be arm, uh, armed or, or safe, uh, the control in the coil. Um, it's a lot more difficult to, uh, to push the wrong button now. The coil will detect various um, unsafe conditions and stop commanding the coil, so that's good. 
Um, along the bottom, uh, there are three uh, knobs there, and uh, this allows you actually to uh, control uh, dynamically um, the upper limits and the amount of power that's uh, being scheduled to the system. Um, it also allows you to uh, control the range of, of notes um, that the, the system is allowed to play. Um, this is kind of important so that um, if you're playing around with a new piece of software, a new keyboard, uh, that you don't accidentally you know, hit a very high note or do something that involves a lot of uh, power. Uh, you can be quite gentle. Uh, there's also a built-in um, signal generator kind of for testing, so you can, uh, uh, you can send arbitrary waveforms there. And uh, here, here's the connectors on the back. Um, so apart from a fiber optic connection that goes to a uh, dual resonance style coil, um, there's another couple of connectors which are over to the, uh, to the right which are interesting. These are for controlling a, the 20 kilowatt um, 1 kV DC power supply. Um, and how we test that is uh, use MIDI to play a, a commercial oven element. So you could like hit a couple of keys and like bam, just drop a whole lot of power into this element. Um, it's how we make sure that uh, before we actually played it live on the coil that we weren't going to blow anything up uh, except for an oven. Uh, so, you know, controlling el um, large amounts of power by just playing a musical keyboard seems very wrong, um, but that's what that, uh, those connectors allow you to do. Okay, um, so there's a bit of an interesting uh, side note here about why Chime Read is called Chime Read. Um, so uh, a friend of mine um, uh, had to deal with uh, IEDs when he was on patrol. So um, very early on, uh, they gave his squad a, an IED jammer, it's just a, a GSM jammer, um, called Warlock Red, which is not used anymore. Um, and uh, it's not used anymore because if you turn it on, it jams everything, um, including your own radio. So uh, if something, um, it might stop an IED, but also stops you from calling for help if you need to. So people would never turn it on. Um, and so this system's called Chime Red because coils are horrible interference sources. Um, when uh, we were first doing performances with, with VJs, they go to a lot of trouble to set up these nice projectors, these very long uh, HDMI runs, um, which are great um, antennas. Um, and I try and point out that I'm, I'm using a, a 20 kilowatt death ray, you know, like about 20 feet away, and they're like, no, that should be fine. I'm like, well, let's see. So we'll play a couple of notes and bam, 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 down, all go down the controllers. Uh, we'll lose some fuses and uh, everyone is, is running and screaming. So. Um, uh, there's some things you can do to, mon uh, to minimize it. The, the controller itself, as you saw, is built into a metal box. It's kind of in a, in a Tesla bomb shelter. Uh, but that's no good for everybody else. So um, in a lot of live performances now, we actually put the entire system um, in cages. And for very large performances, we put uh, the musicians in a cage uh, and the coils on the outside, um, just so there's some separation. Um, yeah, radio frequency just tends to get into to everything. Uh, in my house, uh, I have a separate RF ground um, installed. Um, the network connections downstairs uh, to upstairs are fiber optic. Um, there's a, a separate 100 amp uh, three-phase circuit that's specifically for coils, and uh, everything's on UPSs and everything else. And, and sooner or later, you know, things still get uh, still get zapped. So uh, pay your insurance. And this leads to a um, a problem that. Um, uh, was very familiar, I mentioned this earlier with uh, Ableton. So um, one of the problems with MIDI is that it's an unacknowledged protocol. Um, if you send a command, um, there's no way for the receiver to tell you that you know, it got it. Um, and this, this can lead to, uh, to hanging notes. You know, if you suddenly stop playing, you know, something doesn't get the note off, and so the note continues to play. Um, on a regular synthesizer, that's just annoying. Uh, on a coil, that's, that's pretty bad. Um, you have that thing continuously run. So there are fail-safes kind of built in uh, the system to guard against that. Um, and uh, uh, there's also a special Ableton mode um, that detects when uh, Ableton has said something in the wrong order and just kind of silently fixes it up. So um, something I'm considering doing maybe as a side project is like a, because um, it's, it's not just Ableton, it seems to be quite a, a common problem, is to have a, uh, a MIDI rearranger box. Like MIDI comes in one side and it just has one light on it which says, there, I fixed it. Um, comes out the other end and, and just things just work. But it's quite common to see on MIDI devices like a, a panic button, and all this is is just to go like, oh, you know, something's happened, push this button, make everything stop. Um, and our controller that's not good enough, so we have a, a system to detect when there's a hanging node and, and shut it down. Okay, um, 
So I think I've gone pretty rapidly uh, through this. Um, so I I've got some, uh, some other videos I can show you, but it'd be great to ask uh, for your questions in, in a moment. Um, but just before I do that, uh, there's a, uh, uh, a paper on the system coming up um, in Texas in a couple of months. Um, uh, it was interesting, an interesting exercise to figure out how to cite America's Got Talent. Um, I feel kind of a bit wrong by that, but you know, that's apparently where we are, um, as a, kind of a description of like the state of the art. Um, but that'll be, that goes into some detail, through the detail on how the system works. Uh, better um, uh, digital audio workstation integration, so we hope to, to make it um, easier. So at the moment, I just implement many things in the MIDI standard, but um, I want to make it even easier than that so that um, you can uh, configure an Ableton instrument, for example, and it has uh, values in there that you can tweak and, and change very easily and automate. It would be nice to be able to uh, have multiple coils from the same chime bread. When we do multiple coils now, each one needs its own controller. So it would be nice to have like an orchestra of death um, and make that scale. It would be kind of ni nice. Um, and also, like I said, there's a, uh, uh, a PCM input module uh, option. Um, yeah, we, can, we can make the coil talk uh, and blow a few fuses, so there's still some work to do. Um, but I hope to be able to show you that uh, in the future. So before I go um, uh, any further, um, you know, thank you for listening, and I'd love to take your questions if you've got any. So, are there any questions for Josh? Come on, come up to, to the microphones. Don't worry. If, if you leave the room, stay quiet, please. Any questions? Just wave your hands at the microphones. I can't see you. Ah, excellent. On the left side, please. Um. We can't hear you yet. Okay. Try no? again. Yes. Okay. Um, all nice videos and stuff, but I think most people here came like thinking, maybe we see some awesome lightning stuff in real. Okay. I could have thought earlier we have not enough power here and security and all that. So, but where can we see it for real? Oh, um, oh I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, to disappoint. Yeah, sorry, I, I wasn't able to, to bring the, the system with me. Um, there is a, I believe there is a, there is a coil um, that uh, someone has, has brought along uh, about a block over um, that you can, you can see. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, uh, please come visit me in New Zealand. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not ready to quit my, my day job, um, but perhaps when I can, I'd love to be able to, to take some time off and, and bring some coils around the world a bit. At the moment, there I need to build some road cases. They're quite hard to transport. And what I've heard, there's at least one Tesla coil at the camp. Uh, so just put it on Twitter, and somebody will guide you there. Yeah. Well, thanks for the talk. Um, was there like some uh, situation where it was really dangerous and you really get harmed or fire and nearly all get killed? <laughs> oh. Uh, no, actually, everything has been very, very safe. Yeah, nothing has, <laughs> no, nothing has happened. Um, so I have actually uh, sat in a, a very large coil while it runs. Um, a friend of mine has built a, a very large. Um, this one's a 50 kilowatt coil, and uh, I go sit in the in the toroid when it runs, um, right on the high voltage wire. So um, I sit at about um, a million volts, and uh, you um, are down there at about. Uh, um, from my point of view, some strange negative voltage. So that's very strange for you, but I think I'm at zero. Um, and that's kind of uh, fun because um, you can poke objects out uh, through the toroid um, and you can throw lightning bolts at people, um, which is fun to, to make them uh, scream and run away. Um, but you also have to be very careful not to, to put any part of yourself actually through that because the, the field will enhance off your body and, and then you'll be very sad. So um, fortunately, uh, friends of mine have um, uh, been able to keep me pretty safe uh, from doing things like that. Thanks, awesome work, and keep going on. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thanks. Back here. Hi, thanks for the, uh, the talk. My question is, uh, can you modulate the sound by uh, changing the composition of the air? 
Oh, um, interesting question. So um, something we have thought about uh, doing, um, well, apart from giving the, the coil uh, something to play with um, as, it, as it arcs, uh, is also uh, feeding it different uh, compositions. So something that's quite fun um, to do uh, is um, run a propane flame effect system next to it and let the arc interact with the flame. Um, and we actually went and filmed this in, in high speed and we saw some interesting things. Um, so uh, at about a thousand frames per second, um, it looks like the, the arc is, is interacting with the, uh, the flame, um, just kind of just hitting it. But if you really slow it down and look at it, it's almost like it, it pushes the flame down in the place where it, the arc hits. Uh, and uh, I don't understand exactly what's going on there, but that suggests that something interesting is going on and that maybe yeah, we can feed it some, uh, some different substances or different uh, gases um, and cause it to change. And if we can cause it to change in that way, then we may be able to cause it to change in a, a musically interesting way. Very cool, thanks. Uh, I guess we need the video on this one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, so you're bringing that next e in, in four years to the next camp? Uh, I think I'm, I'm detecting some kind of hint that I need to bring a coil next time. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so we have one more question over here. Uh, nice setup. Um, it's a bit hard to tell from the videos how loud exactly is this? Oh. <laughs> what? Did you say something? What? Yeah, it's, it's actually horrendously loud. Um, so the, the smaller demo videos uh, that I've uh, I showed you there are kind of manageably uh, loud, but the, um, uh, the big coil is, is, is deafening, um, certainly over you know, 100 dB. Um, in fact, uh, I'm not sure what my neighbors think. Like I, I live in a light industrial area, um, and when we run the big system perimeter, like it, it echoes off the hills. Um, and uh, I, I swear there's just people in the neighborhood, they're like, what is that? Like, we just don't understand what goes on. Um, so it can be very loud, um, but generally, obviously, in, in music mode, we try and uh, keep that down. So while the coil is certainly capable of putting out a lot of power, um, it's no good if you deafen your audience so they can't hear anymore. Um, so how low can it, can it do a frequency, and did someone try using it as a subwoofer? Ah, um, so this actually, uh, you can go down to the lowest uh, MIDI note. Um, this is actually where we um, uh, use it as a drum machine. Uh, so as actually see if I've got an uh, example of that. I have one uh, doing a cover of, of uh, Blue, uh, Blue Monday, doing the drum machine for that. This one, um, uh, it throws out very large um, uh, fat uh, arcs, like bang, 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 uh, that we change the, the power slightly so it's more of a, a snap uh, kind of drum sound. Um, so you can get it down uh, that low, uh, but bass notes are, are quite challenging because um, uh, you know you can hear um, the the uh, the points where the, the power is scheduled. So that's one of the first things for having multiple oscillators per note is to have like say many things running each at 30 hertz or 60 hertz and have them all slightly uh, offset to to kind of richen up the the sound. So that the bass is better than um, I think a, a regular coil, but uh, it could it could use some more work. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. So, are there any more questions? Well, if not, I would ask you for another closing round of applause for Josh, please. Thank you.